Engagement, I think, is the key to persuasion. It's the key to connection with an audience. There's so much trouble in the news of like not trusting people that are talking and we need to combat that. Well, first for your listeners, I feel like I need to deal with the elephant in the room. Many people are terrified of clowns. Listen, just last week, this happened to me. There's something about that where everybody's like, oh, man, I think you just went off script. This is just for us. From the city of Beaky Blinders, Birmingham, England, I would like to introduce you to Paddy Dandar. As the world becomes more automated and the robots take over, it's imperative that we build the right human skills for the future. So pull up a chair, grab a smoser or two, and make yourself very uncomfortable. Hey folks, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Superpower School podcast. And today's episode is going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. And if you want to build your confidence in presenting in any way whatsoever in public speaking, then I think this one is for you. I have a guest today who teaches technical public speaking at Google, and he's a professional public speaker. But more interesting for me is he's a former clown, which kind of blew me away. And uh, I can't wait to ask him more about that. So I have the amazing Don Colliver on the show today. Hey, Don, how are you doing? I'm great, Patty. Great to be here. Hello from the San Francisco Bay Area, reaching out to the UK today. So thanks for having me on. And it's 8 a.m. for you, so quite early. It is. I'm dying over here. No, I'm not. I'm great. I'm ready to rock. I'm ready to rock. Fully caffeinated. So I think you're at an advantage over me because it's towards my end of day and it's towards the start of your day and most people are more fresh first thing in the morning. So you're going to have all of the great ideas right now and I'm just going to be like a bit brain dead, I think. Whatever you think, man, whatever, yeah. like I'm, I tend to be the opposite of that. I seem to come alive at 6 PM, 6 to 10 PM is like my primary working hours, but you know, we'll figure it out. Oh, wow. So Don, what superpower would you like to bring to this episode? My superpower I want to bring to your listeners is how to engage with your audience when you are presenting. Because engagement, I think, is the key to persuasion. It's the pr key to connection with an audience, especially for folks in tech who have trained for years to, with formulas and coding and like uh, presenting a process, right? And there isn't much connection involved in like a binary creation of zeros and ones. And I think the time of careful crafting of a presentation and rhetoric and like uh, turns of phrase. It's important for, you know, political speeches or something like that. But when it comes to like updates for your team or presenting to executives, there's a new kind or a different kind of speaking that is essential these days. One which is in connection and being affected by your audience. And we see it. There's so much trouble in the news of like not trusting people that are talking and we need to combat that. And I think we all have a very heightened sense of like, I don't believe this person. And the solution to that is being engaging and engaged with your audience. Oh, I love this topic because it's one that I'm a big fan of as well, because when I'm doing any kind of public speaking, I'm always thinking about how can I connect with the audience in a different way? Because I'd hate to be the guy that just turns up and rattles through a bunch of slides and then walks off again. So I do silly things, Don. I do things like I get everybody up on the feet and we do Indian Bangra dancing. So like we're all kind of like dancing for the first few minutes and other silly things as well. But I think for me, it'd be really interesting hearing your insights, especially for someone who's, you know, working with some of the brightest minds in the world, at the likes of Google. Before we get into that, tell me about this clown stuff. <laughs> yes. Well, first for your listeners, I feel like I need to deal with the elephant in the room. Many people are terrified of clowns. I don't blame you when I was a child. I don't know if you, do you have something called Chuck E. Cheese's in the UK? It's like, a, okay, I don't think you do. It's a kid's restaurant. They serve pizza and there's video games and they have animatronic 
mouses that play band, like songs. And sometimes there's uh, actors in full costumes with big, scary heads of like animals walking around and interacting with the kids. And those actors completely terrified me. And here's why. Because I couldn't see the face. I couldn't see really what was going on. They weren't sharing their honest, how their presence. They weren't being present with me. They were putting on a face. That's the opposite of what I talk about. When I talk about clown presence, I mean absolutely transparent. I am completely present with the audience. The audience knows where I'm at. I prefer to know where the audience is at. And that creates the dialogue. There's no facade, if you will. So when people think of that white faced, red nosed clown, maybe from it, like Pennywise or something, they're terrified because they don't know what's going on behind that makeup. But that's not the what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the opposite of that. So first, now that we put that aside, in terms of my history with clown, I was a longtime television producer. I discovered improv comedy. Actually, I went through a rough divorce and I was pretty bummed. And one day I just decided, you know what? I'm going to do something just for pure pleasure, like zero financial gain. There's no, nobody makes money doing improv. So, and I did it. And it was one of those things. I don't know if you've had this, Patty, where I went in end of the first class. I was like, where's this been all my life? I love this. This is amazing. And I continued just making choices based on love. And eventually I found myself into physical comedy. I found myself into clowning and then I was good at it. So I ended up as a blue man, a member of the blue man group here in the States. I toured as a host clown for Cirque du Soleil partner show through North America here for 800 people a night in a Spiegel tent, kind of poking fun at the audience, interacting with the audience. Um, and then there was so much. I had learned, I started teaching clown and I wanted to get away from just teaching comedians because there was so much that could help people just in jobs and people in tech for real. There was so much crossover. If I could transition over that bridge of like clowns, I don't like clowns. So like I said, it's really about being confident enough to engage with your audience and how that can actually be relaxing for a nervous speaker. If you can get, you probably found this when you have your audience dancing. If you're nervous, if you can start a interaction with the audience, it can actually relax you as a speaker because suddenly you're not alone up there. You've got, you're all there together. You're all there together having a dialogue and that can be relaxing for somebody who's really nervous. You know why you've hit the nail on the head there, Don, because I, I did a presentation with a good friend of mine, a guy called Grant Wright last summer at it was in Miami and we were doing this talk and we saw the numbers of people that had registered and it was like, you know, almost 200 people. And about five minutes before I said to Grant, I said, oh, do you know, dude, I feel a bit nervous. And he's like, yeah, same here. I said, I think we should do the Bangra dancing. So we hadn't planned it. It wasn't something we were going to do like pre-planned. But one of the main reasons for that was for me to relax my own nerves. Because if I see 150, 200 people all dancing and that would actually help me as well, because now I just feel like they're as crazy as I am. So we're all the same now. And that, that's kind of what happened for us. Going back to the Blue Man group, like, how do you get into that group? Because do they have like an interview process? What was the skill set that they look for someone to join that group? I'm just really intrigued. That's all. Yes, there's a very challenging audition process. I think 200 guys auditioned and two made it through in my LA audition. And then, but that just gets you into the training program. This is my cat, oh. by the way. That just gets you into the training program because Blue Man is many things, but one of them is drumming. You have to be a great, fast drummer. And I wasn't a drummer, so they put you in something called drum school. So for a year, all I did was take drum lessons to become an adept drummer. But in terms of what they look for, it, it all comes down to presence and being when you're on stage, even not saying anything, being aware of yourself, but more importantly, being aware and affected by your audience at all times, like taking it all in and the audience can see you being affected. 
And without going too deep into the clown aspect, that's what I work towards in my public speaking, which is very counterintuitive for a lot of folks, certainly for developers and coders, but it's had great effect. It's been really helpful for folks. And that's actually why I wrote my book, Wink, Transforming Public Speaking with Clown Presence. It talks about exactly that. How do you build that to help you engage better and get the results you want from your messaging? And on that note, what is something that somebody could do to start building that engagement with their audience? Well, I like to give three tips, okay, uh, to help a person engage better with your audience. But the primary one, and I remember one day I went to the Los Angeles Public Library because I knew this to be a fact and I needed to find some research to back it up. And I did. I found a study from 2010. It was an academic study in those big biology lectures, you know, when you would go into Bio 101 and there'd be a huge stadium of students and like a little professor down at the bottom. And what they did is they gave all these hundreds of students dials of how engaged they were. And the professor would go through the lecture and try different tactics for engagement to see which would engage the audience. And of course, over time, the engagement started to dwindle. They found that 100% of the time, the entire audience would be engaged when the professor would simply acknowledge something one of the audience was doing, not in a punitive way. It can be like, Patty, you're nodding. It sounds like you're following, you're tracking with me. Is that right? Simply acknowledging what someone in the audience is doing immediately engage the entire audience. It may be because everybody's like, oh, geez, he's actually watching us. There's actually a human up there and he's in dialogue with us. He could talk to me next. It may be that. But regardless, the entire audience was immediately engaged. So tip number one, acknowledge something your audience is doing. Second thing is make it present. This is kind of like what you did with the is Bangra. Is that how you say it? Bangra yeah, dancing? Bangra dancing, yep. Yeah. Bangra dancing, yes. In virtual lectures and virtual classes, sometimes at the top, I'll have people look out their window and type in the chat what the weather is like where they are. Just something that makes them realize, oh, wait, I'm not watching a television show right now. I'm, I am present here. It can be, it can even be look through your handout. Something that gets them back tactile in the room can also re-engage. You can have them like talk to their, ask a question to the person sitting next to them. That just gets them present again. And the last tactic, which is a well-worn one, and you've probably had people on here talking about it, is telling a personal story. That also feels, I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a, presentation where the person's like trucking along and delivering their data and all of a sudden they're like listen just last week this happened to me there's something about that where everybody's like oh man i think you just went off script this is just for us this is just between us and there's something about those personal stories that also gets your audience leaning in and engaged so those are kind of my three tips to help people engage with their audience Oh, fantastic. Each of those I resonate with and uh, probably use them unknowingly. <laughs> so, Certainly. Yeah. And uh, I mean, obviously the storytelling one is one that often is more mainstream, I think, taught. So that's one that I definitely do use intentionally. But the observation of the audience and pinpointing things out to them, that's a really good one. I like that because I've never Yeah, I think it it's way. important to not do it punitively. It's easy to be like, hey, listen up, Patty. You're, you, you stop it, you know? And then it'll be like, oh, geez, then the whole audience, you may turn the audience on you. But doing it in a fun way or celebratory way is probably the best use of that tactic. And Don, have you ever had an absolute disaster when you've been doing public speaking? And if so, could you give us some, some of those, oh, that story? Oh, man. Well, I speak for companies. Companies book me to speak at trade shows, technical trade shows normally, sometimes medical trade shows. So I'll be in the booth. I'll have like an eight to 12 minute presentation. I deliver over and over again all day long. I try and fill the booth. It's usually like 15 to 20 seats in there. So it's kind of a mix of 
public speaking and side sideshow showman, if you will, of like, hey, come on, come on, everybody, have a seat, have a seat. We got some t-shirts or whatever. You're, but, you're not dressed um, as a blue man then, no? No, okay. I'm not. Although I would love to be dressed as a wacky character. It's funny. I've been booked a few times for some d- demand gen gigs for tech companies, and I've been a wacky barista talking about data security and a, oh, and a super intense and wacky, normally my thing is wacky, a personal trainer pushing a hard drives. Anyway, back to your story. You were wondering about Jing moments in presentation. So I was in Nashville. There I was, right? I was presenting, delivering presentations about medical devices to doctors and nurses, serious stuff. And I was actually emceeing and giving small bits of product information between subject matter experts who would deliver stuff. And uh, we had someone delivering a story and something about a product. And, a, and the story involved a child passing away. Like, oh my God, it was the most intense. And the presenter would tear up. She would deliver this all day long. And each time, because it was a really great and not great, but sad and, prof- and profound story, that really showed the need for this device. And it was in Nashville, right? So part of the trade show hook was they would have country music imp- singer impersonators walking the floor, interacting with the attendees. And right after this presentation, and I'm like dealing with the audience, the Dolly Parton impersonator walks into the booth and starts doing shtick with me on the microphone in front of all these physicians who are just like, wow, that was a really emotional story. (laughs) And, um, and to my point though, we did our thing. I responded to the impersonator. She moved on. (laughs) I turned back to the audience and I just acknowledged what was happening. Like, I was like, wow, that was weird. Like we had that really emotional, powerful story. And then Dolly Parton just walked in. What an experience. I didn't have to solve the problem, but simply acknowledging what was going on in the moment and acknowledging what we both saw kind of took the pressure off. I don't know if you've ever been in a presentation where there's like a car alarm going off or something and the presenter will not acknowledge that noise. They're going to keep powering through. And the whole audience is just like, please acknowledge it so we can take it off our mind. So It just goes back to acknowledge what's going on in the moment. It's going to get the audience on your side. I've got a great example of that just happened recently, which we were hosting an event, a virtual event on Zoom, and we had over 150 people on the Zoom and we had a Zoom bomber on the call. The worst. Oh, done. It was awful because... Like, what do you do as a speaker? Do you just continue and just rattle through while this person's trying to disrupt everything and they're putting on all of these profanities, you know, on on the audio? Now, whilst we're as hosts trying to find out who this person is so we can eject them from the room, and as you can imagine, 150 people, we're going through all the names, we're trying to figure out who this person is. The speaker was amazing, a lady called Heather Martinez. She was just phenomenal because she acknowledged that this was happening. And made a joke of it as well, because I think if she had ignored it and just carried on battling through without acknowledging it, somebody would have, you know, pitched up and said like, Hey, can we sort this out? But she acknowledged it and said, we're going to continue. Like you carry on, we're going to continue. And yeah, thanks for that silly remark. And she just carried on and it was great because it enabled the audience to relax a little bit and and know that she's in control. She's got things like, you know, we just got to trust her. And we'll figure it out eventually. And that's what we did. We ejected this person out of the room. And uh, luckily, the rest of the session went really well. So what a great example. Yeah. And just to give a takeaway for your audience, another thing I like to do, this, this is more for small meetings or classes, or if you have to do a presentation to a small group, obviously, all kinds of crazy stuff happens in the news, like all the time, like very powerful stuff, which is profound cultural shifts and that sort of thing. And I deal with this often in tech companies. There's so many layoffs going on. Like, how do you deal with that if you come in the week after a huge round of layoffs and you're like, I'm going to give this inspirational story. Like, do you just ignore it? 
One thing I've found that works really well, at least for interactive type workshops, is giving a, a moment at the top of the workshop to for everybody to go around and share for 30 seconds what's on their mind. And if they don't have anything on their mind, they can share something they're grateful for. And I'll also say you also have to lead us all in a stretch. I call it stretch and share. So everybody will be like this. Here's what's going on. Blah, blah, blah. My team got eviscerated last week. It's really overwhelming. I cried a lot. And but frankly, I'm glad to be here. And there's something about and again, I don't as the facilitator have to solve it, but simply making space for it and nodding and saying thank you. Is all it takes, like I call it holding the space. It's a it's something I got from like my performance training. If you can hold the space for uncomfortable emotions, you don't have to solve it. Simply be like you said, like your your facilitator, a pro who can be like, this is happening. We got it. I'm in control. We're going to be all right. The audience is like, they've got it. He's behind the wheel. I can relax. Yeah. Oh, great advice there. And Don, we mentioned you go into the likes of Google. Now, for a lot of people, Google... Uh, almost like the pinnacle in terms of masterminds in tech. They are seen as the top of their game. They have all of these bright minds. Why do they need public speaking help? Wow. You could write a book on that. Not everybody needs public speaking help at Google, for sure. There's some brilliant award-winning championship public speakers at Google. A fellow named Gopi, I believe he's chief evangelist, won the Toastmasters International Speech Competition, I believe. But I think just to speak in terms of technical folks, developers, coders, the easiest way for me to visualize it is if I ask you a question, how did you get to this like, what's your take on on our, a decision we should make? A developer, their response will be, they'll start at the beginning of the research and talk you through exhaustively every step. And at the end of what they say, they'll say, so here's the answer. And it's the challenge is, can we flip that? Can you say, my answer is X and here's Y? I think that's the easiest way to explain how a programming type person has trouble when they're presenting because they want to give you all the data and build up to the conclusion. Whereas in terms of our like click baity world, just give me the answer, explain it. And if you just give me the answer, I may be like, I don't need the explanation. I just needed your answer. Thank you for that. And a lot of executives are like that. They get impatient. If the person is just explaining without giving an answer and it makes sense, like I want to justify, I want to justify how I came up. So you can't disagree with me. I get it, but I'm trying to encourage people to be like, be brave, say your opinion, back it up and then have a dialogue about it. Yeah. And especially in the world we live in now, I think we think of TikTok culture where we want the answers condensed right down into this like one minute video. And any more than that, it feels like it's overkill. I just don't have the patience to sit there and listen beyond that. And it feels like, especially with our attention span shrinking all the time, we've got so many distractions going on. It becomes really important in terms of how we deliver messages. And I think you're absolutely right there. We need to start getting into that mindset of the audience and really feeling like, well, how am I going to articulate my message for them? One of the things I talk a lot about actually, Don, is how the world right now is so different to what it was like 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yet, if we think about business meetings at work, not much has really changed. They still continue to be one hour long. We still continue to have these standard agendas. And in terms of adapting to what a meeting should be like now, not much has really changed for a lot of people. And so I think absolutely about public speaking, but also even just general day-to-day -day conversation. It feels like we're still using old historic methods that haven't adapted to what we need now. Like, what, what are your views on that? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. You mentioned very briefly before about becoming audience focused and boy, I'm 
a complete culprit of this. I want to justify why I'm there as opposed to what does my audience need and how can I provide what they need? And it's a different structure in moving into a present. In terms of meetings, boy, like how has it been for you in terms of the virtual shift? Like, are you moving back to mostly in-person stuff? Are you still splitting hybrid? What's going on? I think, yeah, we're, I'm still in a bit of a split at the moment, but I much prefer the face-to-face -face. as a presenter. I just feel like I can physically feel the energy from people when I'm faced with them, whereas Zoom and Teams and all of these tools, they're great, but I don't get that same connection with the audience. Yeah, yeah. And it's so weird. Some people are much more relaxed virtually and very nervous in person. And some people, it's the opposite. Some people virtually, for some reason, when they see all the squares, they are terrified. Whereas they're a little more relaxed in person because they can really see what's going on with the audience. Like you say, I can really read the room in person. So it's interesting how it hits different people. I, weird, like I like both, like to be honest, I like the fact I can sit at my house and like speak to 200 people. And plus I don't have to drive and park and all that stuff. But yeah, anyway, yeah, for sure. I was going to ask you about nervous speakers so you mentioned some people can be quite nervous is there ways that we can help those folks and i know you have a deep background in improvisation is there any improv stuff that we can do because i would love to do more improv but i haven't really had the opportunity and everybody keeps telling me like you should do it it's really enlightening so i'd love to hear if you've got any examples that we could use there Oh my gosh. Yeah. I always say, I'm sure Patty, there is a intro to improv class within 30 minutes of your house. Like you could probably find one and the basic rules at the basic level are kind of all the same, but I think the takeaway at what it helps with folks struggling with nervousness or something like that, you're placed in a constructed, constructed situation where whatever you say is great. You can trust your impulse in this space. The space is built for agreement. And so, so often there's so many filters that folks have to wrestle with. And you, I can see it in my public speaking classes. You know, we do ex extemporaneous practice, Q&A sessions, drilling on Q&A, how to deal with that. And you can see them, the mind and the gears freezing as they're like, trying out different responses before it comes out of their mouth. And what improv taught me is oftentimes my impulse is better than anything I could have pre-written last night. It's all there. I just need to learn to trust it and be confident with it. So that's what improv over time helps with. But in, in terms of nervousness and dealing with nervousness, I think just standard stuff. Can you find low stakes practice opportunities that are regular? You're not going to get better if you just rehearse and worry for one presentation every two months. That's not a recipe for getting more confident. But if you can join a Toastmasters group and go every week and give a two minute talk about, I don't know how the meeting went, like they have different roles. Meetings are built so everybody gets a chance to talk for a little bit in front of the group every week. If you can just find low stakes, regular opportunities, you're going to get more confident. Maybe your spiritual community has an opportunity where you can get in and speak in front of five people, 10 people on a regular basis about something you care about. That's how, that's what worked for me. Uh, when I started doing trade show presentations, I would go do these presentations like once every three months and I'd be so nervous. I was like, how can I this this muscle? How can I work this muscle? And I was like, I'll just do Toastmasters. And it was amazing. It was great. Don, we're almost at the end of time. So I'd love to hear any resources that you would recommend for anyone who's thinking of being brave and engaging in this way or even some seasoned speakers, like what kind of resources would you suggest that they start off on, look at beyond Toastmasters? Because that's a great resource, isn't it? Sure. Resources. Well, a book that was really helpful for me, and you've probably read it. I mean, Emotional Intelligence, It's it feels like 
it had its heyday and like, just like design thinking was popular. I don't know, seven years ago. And then it trickled down and then it was emotional intelligence trickled down. But I still, I love a book called Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Travis Bradbury and a few other authors. And the reason I liked it was it's very actionable. It gives you tests and it gives you actionable things to do to get better. And there's two elements of the emotional intelligence that apply to speakers. The first is self-awareness. If you're in the midst of a speech and your shoulders start to come up and you feel antagonism from the audience, but you don't realize you're starting to get tense, you're not functioning at 100%. And if you don't realize that, you may answer in a defensive way to a question or something like that. Step one is to recognize physiologically when you're not completely present, when you're starting to get stressed or your breath is going up or your diaphragm is getting tight. And that book helps you start to realize that. So does meditation. It gives you, starts to help you with like a, I call it a just being a dispassionate observer of yourself. And then kind of the next step is being aware of the emotions of the audience. That is also really important. And I read what's happening with Patty right now. Is he with me? Is he following? Is he tracking? So that was a great help to me. And in terms of engagement, I actually put free exercise on my website that your listeners can grab. If you go to doncolliver.com forward slash engage, there's a simple exercise you can do with maybe four or five other people on your team. And this is for more advanced speakers. And you can, it, what it does is it starts to force you to split your attention between the topic you need to cover, as well as the, uh, where your audience is at with engagement. And you learn to balance these two things equally. So I, that's been a really useful exercise for me to practice on my speeches. Oh, fantastic. I'll definitely be checking that out because that sounds like a really valuable tool and one that I'm sure I could benefit from. I love the way the cat's made another appearance. And what's the cat's name? Because we have two guests today on this show. <laughs> well, we've got three. This is Tuna Baby and Rigby is up on the shelf above my camera right now. Oh, wow. Okay, great. And they've been well behaved. So thank you, cats, for uh, being so well behaved. So Don. Really do appreciate your time today. You mentioned if people want to get in touch with you, could you just give us the name of the website once again so people can contact Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Sure. For my free exercise on getting engaged with an audience, go to doncolliver.com forward slash engage. Got it. Thank you so much, Don. And I will be checking out the Blue Men Show again online somewhere and see if I can spot you or recognize you in the group. <laughs> Very good luck. Everybody looks the same. <laughs> there you have it, folks. It's the end of another insightful episode. And as always, thank you so much for sticking around to listen to this episode and for helping support me and encouraging me to create more content for you guys. If you'd like to get in touch with me directly, you'll find my email address in the show notes or equally head over to the website and click on the contact link. And I promise I will respond to every single message I receive. I'm always looking for your feedback. So if you'd like me to change things up or improve things, I would love your opinions. If there are topics that you would like us to do future episodes on, or there are other great speakers that you are aware of, then please do mention them and uh, we'll see if we can make it happen. Thank you once again. 